Welcome to the Radical Truth Podcast. I am your host, Glenn Meldrum, and this podcast is brought to you by In His Presence Ministries. Visit us on the web at www.ihpministry.com. We finished studying verses 1-3 through three of chapter 4 in our last lesson on 1 John. Those verses focus on the problem of false prophets and how to not be deceived by them. Since their salvation is directly tied into believing the truth, and since Jesus himself is the truth incarnate, then it's far more important than we might realize to not be taken in by false prophets and teachers. Since the next three verses continue John's discourse on false prophets, we need to look a little more deeply at this difficult yet necessary matter before we move on to John's next subject. Let's begin by reading these three verses, and then we will start breaking them down to see what more we can glean on this extremely important issue. Verses 4 through 6 read, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. John's use of the title, Dear Children, can be applied in two different ways, and we see this played out according to how the individual translations interpret the Greek. One approach is to use this as a term of endearment in a personal way, and this is why a few translations rendered the Greek as, My Dear Children. The majority of translations choose to make this a little more fluid, and this can be seen in the New King James Version that reads, You are of God, little children. This rendering of the Greek can be understood as a term of endearment from John or an expression to affirm that they belong to God and not the evil one. This second expression is all the more apparent by stating that we are from God. It's obvious that John is addressing genuine disciples of Christ and not those outside the faith. That they are of God tells us that they are under the influence of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of every true follower of Christ. The next point the apostle makes is that they had overcome them. The first thing we need to ask is, who is the them that John is referring to? And secondly, how did the church overcome them? Given the plain wording of this portion of Scripture, we can see that the them refers to the false prophets and teachers who are antichrist in spirit. We could make the sentence read a little clearer by wording it this way, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome the false prophets. John could make this point because of those to whom he was writing hadn't given themselves over to the false prophets and teachers. The second question, how did they overcome them, has two answers. The first can be easily stated. They refused to follow the prophecies and teachings of false prophets and teachers who are messengers of the spirit of Antichrist. There's more to their overcoming the false prophets and spirit of this world than by just not following the false prophets and their erroneous teaching. The answer to the second question, how did they overcome them, is seen in the next point in verse 4. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Without living near to Jesus, we are all deceived, and this isn't an exaggeration. Every person is deceived in believing lies until they come to saving faith. From that point on, true believers need to have their minds renewed like Paul taught in verses like Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. John clearly stated this truth in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. This is just another time that John referred to the world, which is in Greek, cosmos. His application of the word speaks of the spirit that defines the world of men, which is evil and hostile to God. It is antichrist. He emphasized the extent of this demonic influence upon mankind by stating that the whole world is under the control of Satan and his demon forces. Paul established in Galatians chapter 3, verse 22 the reason why the whole world is under Satan's rule. But the scripture declares, that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. The apostle to the Gentiles more fully argued this point in his theological treatise called Romans. In chapter 1, Paul makes the point that all Gentiles or non-Jews are sinners. Then in chapter 2, he proves that all Jews are sinners. Then in chapter 3, he demonstrates that all of mankind are sinners. He wrote in chapter 3, verse 9, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. In the next verses, he moves on to proclaim this truth in very strong and clear terms. 
As it is written, there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This torrent of just condemnation of the human race is a compilation that Paul pulled together out of the Old Testament, so this isn't something new. He went on to state in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Mankind is accountable to God for her willful lawlessness against God and His kingdom. They are sinners by nature and by choice, and their open rebellion against God deserves the justice of His wrath. Through the knowledge of our sinfulness, we can be led into the knowledge of the only one who can save sinners from the damnation they justly deserve. Of course, this is Jesus, our only Savior. The whole world is under the oppressive rule of Satan due to their willful sin. To understand this truth without knowing Christ should be terrifying. But the mass of humanity doesn't comprehend this because they choose to remain in ignorance. Yet for those who belong to Jesus, we can overcome the hosts of hell and the lies of false prophets because the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. We don't overcome because we are able, but because Christ is infinitely able. Left to ourselves, we revert back to the natural condition of believing lies of one sort or another. It's like a garden that's left unattended. It doesn't take long before it's overgrown with weeds that choke out its life. We can't overcome the forces of hell at work in this world without becoming dependent upon Christ. Even when we know this fact, we have a very hard time dying to our natural love of self-rule. There's only defeat in this, not victory. We overcome the world and all that it stands for because of the one who abides in us is causing us to overcome. In the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus taught that He is the Good Shepherd, and His followers are sheep that belong to Him. In verse 5, Jesus stated that His sheep will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from Him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. The stranger speaks a language that sheep can't understand and flee from the stranger. Those of the world speak the language of the world, even if their words are cloaked in religion or prophetic kind of words. The wisdom John gives is of tremendous value. If we truly belong to Jesus, then the language of the world, along with his practices and culture, will become alien to us, and we will see it for what it really is. It's as if we speak the language of heaven and they the language of hell. Their crude, vulgar language is repulsive. It's sensual, seductive, alluring, and poisonous. Their words are filled with death, for it leads people down the broad road to hell, so the stench of hell is in their words. That's the language we once spoke, but we have been given a different language, one that's from heaven, that's beautiful, clean, and gives strength and life. It fills the soul with joy and peace because its words are filled with life that comes from God. This is the only language that comes from heaven, and it gives true life, eternal life. All the languages of men and devils give death, for they feed the sinful nature of man in his rebellion against God. Every false prophet and teacher are from the world, and this is what John taught in verse 5. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. The world listens to false prophets since they speak the language of this world, and that should terrify those who are listening to false prophets. It's irrelevant if the false prophetic voice comes through political pundits, Hollywood celebrities, or religious gurus. The language the world speaks is defined by cosmos, and the spirit of cosmos rules everyone who isn't an authentic follower of Jesus. The thought that they speak from the viewpoint of the world is just another way of talking about our worldview. What is a worldview? A simple definition is that it's the overall view of the world in which we live. This isn't about the physical world in which we live, but a philosophical view that encompasses everything that exists and how it affects us and others. Every thinking person has a worldview. It doesn't mean that they have thought out its validity or coherency. Yet they have fundamental beliefs and assumptions about the purpose of man and the universe in which we live. Though most people have never thought through the implications of their worldview, 
They have at least a loose way of answering the fundamental questions about who we are, where we came from, why we're here, and where we are going. This includes the purpose of man, the existence of God, is their life after death, and what we consider to be right and wrong, and why certain things are right and others are wrong. Although there are billions of people on this planet, when narrowed down there are only two worldviews, one that's based upon truth, and the other that's defined by lies. The worldview that's defined by truth is very narrow, in that there's no room for lies or opinions. Either we believe the truth, or we don't. This is the Christian worldview that's defined by the Word of God. The other worldview that's defined by lies has a certain amount of diversity, and here's where you find people's concept of life, family, government, and God. Most of the time, this isn't a formalized philosophical conception of the world, but a hodgepodge of opinions pulled from various places. Though many make the distinction between a secular worldview as opposed to a Christian worldview, the worldview that's defined by lies can be secular or religious, but never truly Christian. Yet every worldview that isn't soundly biblical has its origins in the works of the flesh and the influences of hell. The agents of hell are happy to get into the heart, mind, and soul of mankind any lie that they will embrace. They want to keep us from coming to Christ or take us away from Him if we have. So in this sense, the lies people believe are just as important as what it does to people. A lie is a lie is a lie, and it's secondary how the lie is packaged, for a lie will always be a lie and those who believe them will not make heaven their home. John is exposing that false prophets and teachers have a non-biblical worldview, or using some of John's way of writing, they have an antichrist worldview. False prophets and teachers belong to the world, or belong to cosmos, which is the spirit that defines the entire world outside of biblical Christianity. In Revelation 13, we see a dragon and two beasts. The dragon represents Satan. The first beast is Antichrist, and the second beast his false prophet. In verse 1 we are told, And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads, with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The sea represents mankind, out of which the Antichrist arises. Then John records in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. The second beast, who is a false prophet, is different from the first, since he comes out of the earth. The interpretations of this chapter are diverse, and it's not my purpose to try and tackle this. All I want to do is show how the person called Antichrist rises out of the sea of humanity, and this includes the spirit of Antichrist. The empowering of both Antichrist and the false prophet is the dragon, who is Satan. The false prophet comes out of the earth, which may represent the culture and society of men. As is the case with Antichrist, who is both a person and spirit, so the false prophet includes both an actual person and the spirit of the false prophet. Here again, the dragon is the power behind them both. Satan defines the spirit of Antichrist and the spirit that moves false prophets, whether of old or in our day. Since the Antichrist and false prophet are empowered by Satan, they speak for Satan and do his bidding. This is the same for those John refers to as Antichrist in spirit, and this includes false prophets. The Antichrist is the governmental expression of hell, and the false prophet is its religious expression. Together they create a worldview that's defined by hell. When we look at John's teaching on this Antichrist spirit that defines all false prophets, we can discern who they are because they speak of the world and are defined by cosmos. When we look at the fruit of the flesh that Paul mentions in Galatians chapter 5, we get a glimpse of some of the character traits that define non-Christians in general, and this would include false prophets. The devilish spirit behind false prophets and teachers is going to promote in one way or another the works of the flesh and a worldview that comes from the world. Expressions of this can be seen in those false prophets that promote greed and prophesy financial prosperity or those who promote a message of cheap grace that allows people to continue in the practice of sin. Other false prophets and teachers may promote an ascetic life that breeds religious pride, which is self-righteousness. In one form or another, false prophets and teachers are promoting a worldview that's hostile to God and His Word. What they have to offer feeds the flesh life in one way or another. Those who are defined by the same spirit that defines Antichrist listen to the prophets that speak through the same dragon spirit, who is Satan. 
Those who tend to be taken in by false prophets and teachers must take these truths to heart so that they can be faithful to God and flee from the voices of hell that speak through these deceivers. And those who can discern the truth about false prophets need to stay near to Jesus and be immersed in the Word so that they can stay true to Christ. We are rushing towards our Lord's second coming, and the power of deception will only grow stronger the closer we get. Those who are of the same spirit with the world will be deceived by false prophets of one sort or another. John wrote in verse 6, We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us. The we John is referring to is first a reference to the original apostles and those who have given us the New Testament scriptures. John established his authority in the opening remarks of his letter, saying, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The eyewitness of the life, teaching, miracles, death, and resurrection of Christ had the greatest authority to teach untainted truth. From this vantage point, they have the right to compel those who want to know the truth to listen to them. Though we can personally testify about the work of the Holy Spirit we have seen, heard, and even experienced, we don't have the same authority as those first apostles and disciples had. In this sense, their testimony is more powerful than ours. Yet we can testify how we have been transformed by the power of God, even if our hands have not physically touched the Savior. The we John is referring to could also be expanded to include those who teach the truth that the apostles first taught. We mustn't add anything to their message or take anything away from it. This is where false prophets gain converts, by either adding to what the New Testament clearly teaches or by taking away from the Scriptures to make a religion based upon personal happiness. Because of John's authority as an eyewitness of Christ, he can with bold humility declare, Whoever knows God listens to us. Those who truly want to know Christ will come to know the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit that works through the Word. As we are told in the 10th chapter of John's Gospel, Christ's sheep hear His voice and listen to Him. They won't follow the voice of a deceiver that will try to lure God's sheep away. The key to hearing God's voice is to know Christ through a personal relationship that's obtained through the gift of salvation. If we don't personally know Christ, then we are listening to the voice of this world that will produce eternal ruin. John states very clearly, But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. Those who don't belong to Jesus won't listen to his ambassadors or messengers, the foremost of which are the New Testament authors. Anyone that goes against the plain teaching of the New Testament is rejecting the truth and delving into doctrines of devils. Those who teach doctrines contrary to the word are false prophets and teachers defined by the spirit of Satan. What makes the epistles authoritative is that they are faithful expositions of Christ's teaching that came through eyewitnesses of Christ's life, death, and resurrection. Paul expounds on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-8. through Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, also as one abnormally born. Notice how Paul, like John, states that salvation came by believing the truth that has been faithfully handed down to those who are eyewitnesses of Christ. Paul is unique in this list in that Jesus came to him as one who was born out of due time. Christ came to Paul after our Lord's ascension. Yet during the days of the apostles, he was proclaimed to be an apostle with the authority to write what was quickly accepted as inspired scripture. He was tested by the apostles and proved genuine, as we see in 2 Peter 3, verses 15 and 16. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote with the wisdom God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, 
as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. We can see from this that Paul's writings was accepted as scripture equal to all the other scripture. With the death of those first apostles, the canon of scripture was closed. Any writing that claims to be divinely inspired and an equal or even greater status in the New Testament is a book of lies that was inspired by devils through a false prophet or teacher. Such is the case with Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses to name two. Those who are from God won't listen to lies, and those who are of the spirit of cosmos won't listen to the truth. John adds one final piece to finish the picture puzzle that focuses on the subject of false prophets and teachers. The final sentence in verse 6 states, This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. This is a summary of what John had already written. Those who uphold the New Testament truths are of God, and those who don't aren't. This is how we can recognize those who operate through the Holy Spirit and those who operate through the spirit of Antichrist. No one has to be deceived. God didn't create people for the sole purpose to deceive them. It's the choice of our will whether we embrace the truth or follow lies. Nobody can make us believe lies, not even Satan. And nobody can force us to believe the truth. And this includes God, since he won't violate the gift of free will that he has given all of mankind. In these last moments of the last days, we must do everything in keeping with the grace and power of God to stand true to the end. We can now move on from the important subject of false prophets and return to the subject of love. That's one of John's favorite topics. Let me read verses 7 and 8, and then we will dig into the truths that John is presenting. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. I have already addressed the points John made in these two verses, so I don't want to be repetitious. But since it was a couple of months ago, I will highlight some of the thought. The point that everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God isn't a reference to love in general, since all of mankind has been given the capacity to love. Many have made the false claim that if it's love, then it must be God or it must be right. But this is the devil's lie. Apart from God's transforming grace, we love selfishly. The standard of love isn't the capacity of man, but of God himself that was unveiled through Jesus Christ. From this we can say that the standard of love is Jesus. How did he love? With selfless, disinterested love. This is love that's not contingent upon the response of others or personal fulfillment, but a love that's without any selfish ambition or need of return. This is wonderfully expressed in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As I have quoted many times in this study, that Jesus superseded the second greatest commandment, which is to love others as we want to be loved, with a new command to love like Jesus loves. With this standard in mind, John commands that we love one another like Jesus loves us. To do this, we must seek divine grace to love in a way that's beyond our natural capacity to love. We were originally created to love far beyond the capacity we have right now. In Adam and Eve's sinless condition, they could love to a greater degree than we can. Yet the fact that they sinned reveals that there were limitations to their love and the necessity to look to God to love beyond what they could in their sinless state. The capacity God creates within rational beings to love will always be limited by the sheer fact that we are created beings. To love beyond our capacity takes divine grace, and I believe that this would be true for men and angels. The terrible rebellion of angels proves the limited capacity of angelic beings. For them to go beyond what comes naturally, they too must look to divine grace. Whatever is our natural capacity to love, God can take us further. To love others better, we must realize the truth of our natural limitations as created beings with a sinful nature. Our sinful nature twists our ability to love in horrendous ways. It's through seeing our great neediness that we can run to Christ who will meet the needs of the needy. When we fail to selflessly love others, then we need to cry out to God for grace to love more like Him. This means that there isn't any trial or temptation that can't be met or overcome through divine grace. There are powerful accounts of believers that love their persecutors like Jesus did his. To love those who have done us wrong is never a sanction of the evil they have committed, but it's how we can walk in liberty and be pleasing to God through the midst of the trial. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43-45, through 45, You've heard that it was said, 
Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. By loving our enemies, Jesus said that we prove we are sons of our Heavenly Father. Throughout Scripture, we see the selfless love of God, and when we love like Him, we prove to belong to Him. I think this is a good gauge to determine our spiritual maturity and to help others know whether they are followers of Jesus or not. We all fail at loving correctly, and I would venture to say that all sin is an expression in one way or another of not loving correctly, which is selfishness. Do you want a better marriage? Then love your spouse better. Love more selflessly and overcome your selfish love that wounds. Cry out to God to love in a way that's beyond your capacity, so that God would enlarge your ability to love more like Him. If you love your spouse more like Jesus, then your marriage will change. There may be a time when your spouse can't understand what you're doing or why you're even doing it. But if you will persevere in selflessly loving like Jesus and let the Lord mature you in this, then your marriage will be revolutionized. Jesus went on to say in verses 46 and 48, If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even tax collectors doing that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus is calling us to love beyond our natural ability, and this should first be lived out in the home. How many husbands and wives are enemies in their own home, where the house is a battlefield and the children are the innocents suffering the ravages of war? Jesus commanded us to be perfect, which in the Greek means to be mature or complete. Loving like Jesus is evidence of spiritual maturity, and we are in desperate need of this. This brings us to the disturbing point John made in verse 8. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Many times the actual breakdown of supposedly Christian marriages is that either the husband or wife isn't truly saved, or maybe both aren't saved. If we don't love like Jesus, it's either because He isn't living in us by His Spirit, or we are dangerously full of the flesh and harming those we claim to love. To remain in the heartless condition of refusing to love a spouse like Jesus loves us can move us away from Christ, and if this continues, it can literally take us away from Him. What John said is true. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God gives new beginnings but they come through humility, repentance, and a spiritual revolution. He can bring life to dead or dying marriages if we are willing to repent and start loving like Jesus. Thank you for listening to The Radical Truth with your host, Glenn Meldrum. We at In His Presence Ministries pray that this weekly podcast will be a blessing to you. Please tell others about it and subscribe yourself to this free podcast. Don't forget to visit our website at www.ihp. M-I-N-I-S-T-R-Y dot com. See you again next time, and may God richly bless you as you seek Him in spirit and in truth. And thirst no more So come wash in the river Come drink your fill Let healing water